Hello fellow filmmakers, this is Nikki from the Media Division and this is a tutorial all about shutter in filming. Quite often when I read through posts in the filmmaker community, I see questions about shutter speed. Why is it important? What is the right shutter speed? What are the creative options? And what do I do if I messed up during the shoot? In this tutorial, I will address the shutter from a filmmaker's perspective. To put it in one sentence, the duration of the shutter determines the amount of motion blur in your film. What are you, some kind of nerd? Yeah, yeah, I guess I am. As you might have very different levels of expertise and needs, this tutorial is split into three parts. Part one will deal with the basics. Why is shutter needed for smooth motion? What is motion resolution? And how does motion blur affect the perception of movement. Part two will help you to choose the right shutter speed for any given situation. That part will also deal with technical aspects as flicker from lights or monitors, as well as creative choices. Part three will deal with technical solutions on how to fix shutter speed, address flickering in post and how to introduce motion blur for X shots, for example in speed ramps. I will place shortcuts to each part of the tutorial right here and in the description, so you can skip ahead anytime if you feel like you already know what I'm talking about. So let's start with part one, the basics. If you ever took a photo or filmed, you might have heard or read about shutter. If you haven't, you probably shot in auto mode of your camera or phone. If you're watching this, you probably want to improve the quality of your work. And this is where you shouldn't leave choices like shutter speed, aperture and ISO to your camera. The camera's auto mode will be okay for most situations, but to be able to make creative choices, you should work in full manual. It is not as hard as it sounds and you really will start to learn the effects of different settings. To really understand shutter, you will have to have basic knowledge about frame rates and something that is called motion resolution. This way, these subjects will become transparent quickly. This is said to be the first film ever shot. No film camera, but individual photo cameras were triggered in sequence to capture a horse running. If the individual photos are watched in sequence, the illusion of motion is produced in your brains. Of course, physical and cost restrictions apply and filmmakers try to figure out how many frames are necessary to produce fluent motion. They came up with 12 frames per second as a minimum. A bit further down the road, one of the major improvements to the film experience was to double the frame rate to 24 frames per second and thereby doubling the motion resolution. And we still use this frame rate in cinemas to this day. When TVs were developed, for technical reasons, the standard frame rate for broadcasting was set to 30 frames per second in countries with 60 Hz power line frequency and 25 frames for countries with 50 Hz power line frequency. For this tutorial, 24, 25 and 30 frames per second will be treated as mostly identical in the perception. Be aware that higher frame rates in the distribution of content, not slow motion but actually displaying film at speeds like 48, 50 or 60 frames per second is often associated with the video look, as it reminds many of us how broadcasters used interlaced video for higher motion resolution at the cost of image resolution. That caused a lot of headaches for the workflow, but at this is a thing of the past and a whole other can of worms, we will focus just on the information that is necessary to understand shutter. It all comes down to the viewing habits of your audience. If you are going for a cinematic look, I suggest to go for 24 frames per second. This tutorial is actually filmed at 25 frames per second, as this is the standard in Europe, and it helps me to display shutter problems in the house section of this tutorial. You will see that later. So, what does it all have to do with shutter? 24, 25 and 30 frames per second is much better than 12 frames per second, but it's actually not a lot of motion resolution. Therefore, it will look choppy. Let me show you. This is a simplified metronome that will show you how motion blur affects the perception of movement. The shutter speed you choose will determine the amount of motion blur in each frame. A metronome is perfect to show everything that is relevant as it has elements that don't move and elements that move at different speeds. As shutter effects can be subtile, the effects will be better visible if you watch this on a large screen and not on a phone. 
As long as the metronome is not moving, you will not see any effect. So let's set this in motion. This is the metronome moving at medium speed displayed with 25 frames in one second. You can freeze the movement at any time, like we do now, and you will see a sharp still image. You can also see that the movement is choppy. Basically, your brain registers several still images at the same time. This is similar to the effect when you see movements in a strobe light, like the ones you can find in a nightclubs. The faster the movement is, the more obvious the effect gets. We call this strobing. From a filmmaker's perspective, you usually don't want this. You want a natural looking movement. We could achieve this with a higher frame rate or by adding motion blur. If we are bound to a standard frame rate like 24, 25 or 30, motion blur is the only option to get smooth movement. This is the same metronome with motion blur. It does look different, doesn't it? The movements look smoother and the strobing mostly disappears. Again, the effect is more visible with faster motion. If you now just stop the animation, you'll see that we don't see a sharp image but blur on moving parts. The faster the motion, the more motion blur. Exactly what you see here applies to a film that you shot with your camera. If you want to have a smooth movement with standard frame rates or slow motion for that matter, you need motion blur and you need the right amount of it. Shutter speed allows you to increase or decrease the amount of motion blur that is in your image and therefore it changes how motion in your film is perceived. Let's recapitulate with the help of our metronome. A shutter that is too fast will introduce too little motion blur on standard frame rates. Therefore moving objects will look choppy depending on their speed. With a shutter that is just right, movement will look natural at any speed and your brain will not even register the motion blur in the movement. If the shutter is too long, moving objects will have a high amount of motion blur. Depending on their speed, objects will be perceived as blurry. Of course, moving the camera itself and therefore all objects in the frame will influence blur in the exact same way. That includes objects that don't move by themselves. Always be aware that a change in shutter will change the amount of light that hits your sensor. If you change the shutter speed but you want to maintain the same exposure, you will have to compensate that amount of light. You could add light, alter the aperture, change the ISO or work with a different ND filter to do so. All types of cameras, photo or video, digital or film, small sensor, larger sensor, mirrorless, DSL, all are affected by the same laws in the same way. Even computer generated pictures have to follow this, like I showed with a metronome. Or you can take your favorite Pixar movie and hit pause during movement and you will see motion blur. And exceptions are traditional cartoon films. We are so used to the lack of motion blur in these that nobody ever seems to miss it. Old movies with special effects often use stop motion techniques, like the original King Kong from 1933. The miniatures didn't move at all during exposure and therefore motion blur is absent. This caused unnatural movement that is quite obvious. The figures are strobing while real life actors in cut or overlay scenes maintain natural motion. Even in much later stop motion installments like 1984's The Terminator, the same lack of motion blur breaks the illusion cutting from life size detail shots to miniature animations, especially when mixing real life action with miniature shots. There's a horrible blue screen on this one too. A more complex installment of stop motion is Go Motion, like it was used in 1981's Dragon Slayer. Go Motion actually recorded movement during exposure. The result is an extremely realistic miniature dragon without any help of computers. But due to the complexity, cost and the rise of computers, Go Motion sadly never gained much traction. More modern stop motion films like Chicken Run and the Wallace and Gromit films use computers to render motion blur into traditional stop motion scenes. You will learn how to do that yourself in part 3 of this tutorial. This is the end of part 1. Part 2 will help you to get the right shutter speed and give you examples on how to use shutter creatively. And you will see that sometimes it makes a lot of sense to break the rules. I hope you found this useful.
Please like this video, give me your ideas in the comments and subscribe to this channel if you haven't done so already. I really appreciate every support from you guys. Thanks for watching. Thank you.